Good, good morning, everyone. If I could ask you to please take your seats. We're about to start. So, and we're, we're yeah, I think we have everyone in. Good morning, um, everyone. My name is Ruslan Stefanov, and I'm the program director at the Center for the Study of Democracy. And it is my pleasure to welcome uh, you and our uh, online uh, viewers and participants to um, our next roundtable series uh, on countering the Kremlin playbook. This time, we're focusing on the Black Sea region, I think a region of strategic importance, uh, together with our partners from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. This is already tra uh, traditional, uh, Norbert will speak after me. Let me just say a few words of uh, welcome and uh, introduction. First of all, big thanks uh, again to our partners from Konrad Adenauer uh, and also from um, uh, our partners from uh, Romania, from the Expert Forum, and special thanks to Olena Lapenko from uh, Dixie Group, who will be speaking a little bit later. Uh, Olena has traveled uh, from Kyiv uh, for this presentation. We're very happy to have her here and have uh, her unique uh, uh, insights, and we look forward to, to the discussion. And of course, special thanks to uh, um, our partners and friends uh, from the US, from the Energy Futures Initiative uh, Foundation, Melanie Candendine and her team are here. We've been benefiting from their insights um, uh, a lot. Uh, they've just finished a um, global study on the future of gas. I think in the larger um, uh, uh, setting of things in the Black Sea and uh, region and in Europe, we need to figure out uh, not just the immediate economic security concerns of the region, but also uh, what are our options in our green transition uh, priorities? Uh, how do we set this uh, in uh, the global uh, scene? You know, how do we get a partnership from um, countries, not least, of course, Russia, which is obviously not happening, but how do we prevent uh, uh, um, such future um, invasions from, from happening? And of course, how do we engage with um, uh, countries like China and uh, India on those uh, issues. And somehow the Black Sea region right now is focusing all these different uh, 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 difficult priorities. And of course, we look at the, um, at the region from the perspective, specific perspective of economic security and of what we called the long-lasting, well-built, enduring, um, state capture and disinformation networks that uh, uh, Russia has built in this region. Uh, and we look forward, there's uh, my colleague Martin Vladimirov is going to have a presentation specifically on some of our ideas of how we can de-risk, decouple, I would say, even uh, is needed um, uh, in, in this case, but also how we move forward in, um, uh, in de-risking our relations in the uh, new global uh, energy future. Um, and with this, uh, I would like to uh, uh, give the floor to uh, uh, our partners from the Konrad Adenauer Stift, Norbert uh, Beckmann Dirks. Dirkes. Norbert, the floor is yours. May I have to search for another family name? It's every time very complicated what is this with Dirkes and why you have a double name. Ozan, thank you so much. Last year, that was one of my first. Uh, events, conferences as a new director of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Bulgaria. And I have seen suddenly that our partner, the Center for the Studies of Democracy, is one of the powerful uh, think tanks that we have, not only in Bulgaria, in the region and uh, beyond. Thank you for this and this partnership. It's really, really deep, close and trustful. And I'm very happy that we co-work not only on the, uh, on the Kremlin playbook, also in other fields and especially uh, what's mentioned uh, for the region. Rosla makes it always very easy to have a short speech welcome, and so I welcome everybody here from our partners and friends to have a speech after him. So the most key words in the circumstances of the Black Sea region you have in your welcome, that's great, so I follow you 
without, to contradict, missing only one, and that is the keyword of connectivity. And we will see if we discuss uh, how we can bring people from A to B and goods from A to B, ideas from A to B, so we have to add also connectivity. But I know you have it in mind as well uh, that this is one of the most interesting points, especially also in the frame of the European Green Deal, but also in the discussion what's happened after the war uh, in the uh, whole region, especially on the Black Sea region. And in my opinion, and so, that's one of the experiences of the uh, last months. Bulgaria can play a bigger role in this game, and I think it has to play a bigger role in this game. One time as a battlefield between the Russian influence and European values, and on the other side as a player on the Black Sea with important, with important harbors, connections, and so on. I think that is one of the topics we will also discuss today in so far uh, looking forward, I'm very interested to the presentations. I thank all our partners, our speakers, and all the decent guests there here, and especially the team from Center for the Study of Democracy, and namely you, Ruslan, to organize it every time very well, this important conference. Welcome, and let's start. Thank you so, so much, Norbert. Um, I think we saw firsthand how a lot of things can be weaponized, but definitely energy was the first and foremost that we felt um, after the, this uh, um, in, uh, brutal invasion of Russia, Ukraine uh, from last February. Uh, and it is my pleasure now to give the floor to our uh, moderator for the, today, Victor Jack, who is the energy reporter from Politico. I think there's going to be a lot of talk about um, how we de-weaponize uh, some of these um, uh, areas. So, Victor, uh, up to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So good morning, I'm Victor Jack, I'm energy reporter at Politico Europe in Brussels. Thanks for joining us today at our panel discussion. More than 15 months since Russia first launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the West has responded with a near united front and hammered Moscow with sanctions, with Brussels currently negotiating its 11th package of sanctions. Meanwhile, the war has reshaped global energy flows with the EU and Russia undergoing a brutal energy divorce, which has seen Russia's share in the EU's gas import market dip from 45% before the war to less than 10% now. We have a great selection of panelists with us today. Uh, before we start, a few housekeeping rules. So for the first 25 minutes or so, our panelists will share a short presentation on a topic of their choice, followed by 20 minutes of panel discussion. Um, and another 20 minutes left for audience questions at the end. So a brief introduction of our speakers. Um, here we have Martin Vladimirov, Director of the Energy and Climate Program at CSD. He has more than 10 years of work experience in conducting research on energy security, energy transition policy, decarbonization scenario modeling, and foreign economic influence. Here we have um, Melanie Kenderdine, who is the Principal and Executive Vice President of Energy Futures Initiative and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. She is a former director of the Department of Energy's Office for Energy Policy and Systems Analysis under President Barack Obama. Here we have um, Otilia Nutu, head of the energy program at the Expert Forum in Romania and the EU coordinator of the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum. She also works as a consultant on the World Bank on public administration reform. We have Elena Lapenko over there, um, energy security expert at Dixie Group, a think tank founded in 2008 in Kyiv, which focuses research related to information policy, energy, security, and investments. And finally, we have Dr. Marco Amt over here, who is the head of the Political Education Forum of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, Dresden and Deputy Chairman of the Works Council, and former head of the KAS office in Bulgaria. So, without further ado, I'd like to first pass to um, Martin with a short presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Victor. And you mentioned uh, a, a, an energy divorce. Actually, natural gas politics, I remember my professor of energy security uh, was saying that uh, natural gas is really like a marriage. It's very costly. <laughs> It's very long term and very difficult to end. Usually one of the parties doesn't want to end the marriage. So um, thank you very much for coming to this round table discussion. I'll briefly present a short study we developed over the last month assessing the impact of the Russian um, invasion in Ukraine on European energy security 
and how sanctions have fared in uh, achieving decoupling from Russia in the European energy sector. The energy crisis in Europe has shown uh, that the EU is not able to implement really a coherent policy vision for the diversification of energy supply. Although there has been some success, the business has not been finished. To bridge the policy implementation gap, we believe there is a need for a robust instrument to diagnose the most acute energy and climate security risks in the EU so that we can address them accordingly. You see? That's why um, we have launched in 2022, in October 2022, uh, index of energy and climate security risks, which tries to show how Europe has fared over the last 10 years in terms of four main categories. Geopolitics, geopolitics which refers to security supply concerns, diversification potential, uh, etc. Affordability, which focuses on the effect of rising energy prices on industrial competitiveness and energy poverty. Reliability, which is the ability of countries to bring power, gas, and oil reliably to final consumers. And sustainability, which shows whether Europe is on track of a, to achieve its decarbonization objectives. Our assessment revealed that energy and climate security risks have deteriorated since the annexation of Crimea in 2014, as a number of European countries increased their dependence on Russian natural gas imports, with Italy and Germany alone accounting for half of this growth of uh, the risk portfolio. To enable its influence over European energy markets and to achieve this unprecedented dependence, Russia has entrenched powerful patronage networks to influence strategic decisions and undermine common European energy and climate security policy. Sorry. Zooming in on the situation in 2022, and this is a very uh, kind of um, uh, uh, recent assessment, it might not be perfectly complete because some of the data is not available yet, but still in 2022, the EU's energy and climate security risks have jumped to their highest ever, uh, level ever. The swift policy action of the EU countries, though, has reduced at least the geopolitical side of the uh, risk portfolio by 16% year on year in 2022, but the cost has been very high for energy consumers. As you can see on this graph, uh, affordability risks, namely energy poverty and industrial competitiveness, competitiveness have deteriorated over the last 12 months. We believe that energy poverty has more than doubled in 2022 across the EU. One of the main reasons for the de deterioration of energy and climate security risk has been, of course, the situation on the natural gas market, where natural gas supply risks due to, uh, first of all, the unilateral supply cuts by Gazprom, but also secondly, due to the enormous inflow of alternative gas supply from the global market, mostly from US LNG, natural gas supply risks have fallen significantly in 2022 as visible on this graph. And the Russian share of the natural gas markets has shrunk from 40% to below 20% over the past year. Still, Russia remains an important natural gas player in Europe as many EU countries still import significant volumes of pipeline gas and LNG from Gazprom and other players as well. Although Europe has taken steps to reduce its dependence on Gazprom, Russia still ships natural gas to Europe, as you can see here, and it is actually making more money than before. Pipeline imports fell by 62% in 2022 compared to 2021, but Russia still received close to 14 billion euros more in revenues than in 2021. In addition, Russia has seen an increase in its LNG exports to the EU by investing heavily in new LNG export infrastructure. In 2022, Russian LNG sales saw the largest year-on-year -year increase, 30%, in volume terms, leading to a 209% increase in revenues against 16 billion euros to finance 
Russia's war campaign in Ukraine. The current sanctions will not be able to achieve the longer term objective of strategic decoupling from Russia, unfortunately, because they are designed to allow Russia to continue exporting energy. Of course, oil exports to Europe have fallen sharply, but Russia still indirectly exports a lot of crude oil and oil products across the world and to Europe via intermediaries or countries that have special derogations like Bulgaria, like landlocked countries in Central Europe, and via third party countries like Turkey and the UAE, which are using intermediaries to sell Russian crude back to European consumers. I, haven't, I don't have a slide on the nuclear sector per se, but decoupling from Russia in the nuclear energy would be probably one of the most difficult tasks facing Europe and it will take a long-term political com uh, a commitment to complete. This means diversifying nuclear fuels, diversifying technology, and getting rid of Rosatom from major projects around Europe, including in Hungary, Slovakia, <coughs> and Bulgaria. Finally, what can be done to accelerate the strategic decoupling from Russia? First of all, Europe needs to accelerate the implementation of free power EU targets by prioritizing all uh, the elimination of all long-term contracts with Russia, elimination of derogations. Um, we need to ban Russian LNG because right now it actually displaces alternative LNG supply to Europe. How can we increase the supply of LNG from friends, from allies, so French shore LNG supply to Europe so that Russia is not the second largest LNG supplier to the EU. We need to enhance the security supply infrastructure for storing, importing, and transporting natural gas within Europe. There is still a long way to go, although we have done quite a lot in a, a, a pushing through new regasification plants. There is a need in general to align EU and US energy and climate security priorities to speed up the diversification of natural gas supply. I think Melanie will talk more about that, but speeding up the licensing of new LNG terminals on the US uh, coast would be one, of, one way to do that. There is a need to reduce the overall dependence on natural gas by promoting energy efficiency, fuel switching, and deep electrifications with renewables. On the enforcement side, on the sanctions enforcement side, there is a need to minimize the possibility for evasion. This means secondary sanctions on insurers, shippers, and traders of Russian crude that are able to find loopholes in the existing regime and continue selling oil to Europe. There is a need to lower the oil price cap as to make really hurt the Kremlin's ability to finance the war in Ukraine because the Kremlin is still making huge money out of selling oil around the world. And finally, to really decouple, we need to target the state capture networks that over the past decades have enabled strategic partnership be between Russian and European energy companies. And these same companies are still alive and well, and they're trying to get Russia through the back door. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, I'd like to hand over now to uh, Melanie for a short presentation. Thank you, and, and uh, thank you uh, all for coming today. A special thanks to the, uh, to, uh, the uh, Center for the Study of Democracy. Uh, Martin and Ruslan are old and dear friends, and uh, Kalina is a new friend we've met on this trip. Uh, Martin and Ruslan are probably surprised I'm not using slides. This might be the first time you've ever seen me speak without them. Um, and let, let me just say, and, and I'd like to uh, uh, applaud Europe for the brave, creative, successful policies and programs that it implemented to get through the winter. We've got another one coming up. It's not that far away, but but uh, I think that uh, our European allies and, and trading partners uh, deserve an enormous amount of credit for getting through this past winter uh, in very, very uh, dire circumstances. And, and uh, I um, worked at the Department of Energy in the Obama administration 
and Secretary Moniz was the energy secretary at the time, and, and we were there when Russia invaded Ukraine, I mean uh, uh, Crimea, and, and that was in 2014. And at that point in time, I went to Secretary Moniz and said, we need to modernize our definition of energy security. It had always been about oil and the, the OPEC and Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We need a modernized definition of energy security. And so we worked on it. Um, uh, what we came up with was diversity of supplies and routes, including natural gas supplies and routes for them, efficiency and demand response, critical for energy security, innovation in energy uh, technologies, critical for energy security, climate change and reducing greenhouse gases, developing flexible, transparent energy markets and emergency response systems, the, the, the standard definition of energy security. And, and those principles, we, we uh, forwarded them to the White House, they took them to the G7, they were, we had a, uh, a meeting with the energy ministers in Rome, they were adopted by the energy ministers and then went to the G7 leaders EU, G7 and EU, and they were adopted uh, in Brussels in 2014. Since that time, um, we did not talk about cybersecurity because that was, uh, uh, Ukraine didn't get a cyber attacks until 2015, three cyber attacks from Russia. Uh, and we didn't um, uh, focus on the metals and mineral supply that we need for a clean energy transition. So I think <clears throat> those need to be added. We also had a talk at dinner last night, a couple glasses of wine, but it was still brilliant suggestion by somebody here in the room uh, to add AI. That's a huge issue right now, and and uh, that uh, that that could be an energy security concern as well. And just listening to this conversation and to Martin's remarks, uranium enrichment. And, and could be diversity of supplies and sources, but, but I know a lot of VVER reactors in, in Europe and, and, uh, and Russia's uh, monopoly on enrichment for those uh, reactors I think is a problem. And, and importantly in that discussion uh, about the, uh, the energy security principles, a very important component of that was collective action by the US, uh, uh, e EU, and, um, and uh, G7. And so, and I think we've seen that collective action, okay, in the response to the, um, to the uh, Ukraine crisis. And so um, I would say a little bit, and Martin mentioned this, um, uh, that uh, in when Russia uh, there was 22 BCM of Russian gas lost on the European market. The U.S. came in and supplied 19 BCM over the course of the winter. So, so uh, and, and Gutter uh, uh, provided uh, additional LNG, Norway pipeline gas, and so that was very helpful in addition to the European policies for getting through the winter. Um, uh, but the U.S. natural gas is hugely, hugely important uh, for the energy security of the world as, and our allies and trading partners as we transition to a clean energy uh, a future. And um, uh, we are uh, uh, working right now at the Energy Futures uh, Foundation we are working on a global gas phase two study. We're gonna be meeting here today on that this afternoon. And, um, and that uh, phase two will have a deep dive focus on Europe and Asia, two very hugely important markets uh, uh, and for natural gas and US natural gas in particular. Um, and so, so this is very timely as part of that discussion. Uh, we, and that is natural gas in a deeply decarbonized world. So what we are looking at is, is the role natural gas will play in our thoughtful and sequenced policies to deep decarbonization. 
And, uh, and I would say the, we didn't really anticipate it at the beginning. We had our first workshop on our global gas phase two three days after Russia invaded Ukraine. We had invited everyone before, okay? So we didn't know that Russia was going to invade Ukraine. And, um, and President Biden, right, rightfully so, uh, uh, encouraged US LNG cargoes to go to Europe. Our friends and allies in Japan called me up right before the workshop and said, what about us? We need the LNG as well. And so that's where the US comes in, um, uh, and, and it's uh, uh, the largest uh, exporter of gas in the world, the largest producer of gas in the world. And, and uh, Martin alluded to this as well. I testified before the Senate Energy Committee in March of 2022, um, right after the uh, invasion. Um, and, the, uh, and then a year later, after my testimony, our LNG in the US approved and under construction LNG facilities increased 231% in that one year. So, so we are working very hard to ensure uh, the energy security of our friends and allies with that, that uh, LNG. And so um, the, uh, what I would close by saying is I think that this crisis has demonstrated that, that climate change and energy security have to be part of the same conversation as we work to deeply decarbonize by mid-century. And I think this has underscored uh, that, that issue. And, uh, and, and so we need to develop thoughtful policies uh, to support both. So thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, I'd like to hand over to Otilia now. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for, uh, for organizing uh, uh, this event. And uh, I'm going to focus in my presentation uh, on uh, some topics which are uh, likely uh, not going to come up in the, in the discussion. Uh, <clears throat> we have a project together with, uh, uh, with CSD and also with the partners from Ukraine, uh, Moldova, and Hungary. Uh, so I'm going to, to share uh, a little bit of the findings from, uh, from uh, those, um, uh, that uh, research, uh, which is relevant to the sanctions part. So first of all, uh, regarding the sanctions, uh, I would say that uh, the, uh, the, one of the topics that has uh, simply been uh, missed completely from the discussions is uh, not uh, exactly the effect that uh, sanctions had on Russia, but the effect that the sanctions had on us, on the, on the rest of us. And this is uh, particularly important because, um, uh, as you remember, uh, for example, after uh, Crimea uh, in uh, 2014, uh, the lack of a credible uh, package of sanctions actually con uh, allowed uh, a lot of uh, large players uh, in, the, in Europe to continue business as usual. And the crisis that we experienced in the gas sector starting in late 2021 uh, was actually caused by the fact that BASF had sold to Gazprom after uh, 2015 the gas storage uh, in Germany. And this is why we started the winter with, uh, with low gas storage. So what happens uh, is that when you introduce sanctions uh, starting uh, in uh, uh, March last year, February, March last year, uh, what has become uh, impossible anymore is for large players inside the EU, which uh, are very influential on the politicians inside the EU, to continue doing business as usual with Russians as before. And in this, I see the key uh, of the shift of uh, the attitude, for example, in, uh, in Germany or in Western Europe in general, uh, towards uh, continuing uh, business as uh, usual with, uh, with Russia and actually supporting further, uh, further Ukraine. 
Uh, I think that uh, sanctions in the energy sector were uh, good, uh, but uh, there have been also some weaknesses because we are very, very afraid that uh, we are not going to survive uh, the year and the winter and the next winter and so on. And we, uh, we should have been a little bit bolder. So, for example, uh, as Martin was mentioning, uh, Gazprom last year um, uh, used, um, had the opportunity, because of the high gas prices, uh, to uh, make uh, uh, much bigger profits than ever before, despite the lowering of the quantities of the gas. And this is, uh, we, we need to understand uh, how uh, this happened. Uh, in uh, August last year, the prices had increased probably 10 times uh, the normal price before the, uh, before the war. And this was because uh, there was a panic uh, in the uh, TTF uh, gas exchange, and, uh, it, which was caused by the fears of the traders that Europe was not going to fill its storage uh, by the winter. Um, and this uh, pushed the prices on, uh, on the gas exchange uh, very high. The reason why the prices uh, simply spread out across Europe wa was that uh, all the long-term contracts were pegged to, uh, to the uh, index of uh, that uh, uh, gas exchange, including, uh, including Gazprom. And so that means that by a, what we would call a market manipulation, uh, Gazprom managed to make much more contracts in all its, uh, much more money in all its long-term contracts uh, simply by creating that panic uh, in, uh, in August last year. So probably uh, if we had been bolder, uh, we could have introduced even last year a sanction uh, like a price cap on gas, uh, even uh, from the spring. And probably uh, we should have uh, introduced a lower uh, oil uh, price cap and also uh, we should have uh, um, made the sanctions on oil uh, stronger. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, this is something that uh, we need to, to learn from, uh, and this is the reason why we should uh, now look at the only area in which uh, Russia continues to have a dominance in Europe or a very significant influence, uh, and that is the nuclear sector. And Olena is going to, to talk about uh, Dixie's research uh, on, uh, on this uh, topic. <coughs> Uh, the second thing which uh, I think uh, came up uh, very much in the topics about uh, sanctions was that, okay, if we introduce sanctions, Hungary is going to oppose it, uh, precisely in the energy sector. And we've seen that Hungary uh, actually started to become more and more vo uh, vocal in this sense. Uh, but if you look uh, back, uh, we see that in the end, Hungary uh, has voted in the end for the sanctions so far. Uh, and um, in the end, even though at a political level uh, they have uh, increased uh, their, uh, their uh, commerce with, uh, with Russia, they will be forced by the developments in all the markets around themselves uh, to decouple from, uh, from Russian energy. And uh, I will give you uh, just a couple of examples. So, for example, uh, in uh, the sanctions package related to oil, uh, Hungary got a indefinite ex or for, uh, an exemption for an indefinite amount of time uh, for the pipeline uh, for the pipeline oil. And I think we should impose uh, some deadline for that because actually Hungary has the infrastructure which allows it to diversify uh, in probably at most two years. So they have a pipeline which brings um, uh, oil uh, from Croatia and there are some investments which are well known. Uh, some of them need to be made uh, on certain bottlenecks on the Croatia, uh, Croatia's territory. Some of them relate to storage and some of them uh, to mixing units to uh, create the the, uh, the mix of oil which is compatible with the refineries of uh, Mol. And the way to do it, uh, even if uh, Hungary doesn't want to do it, is to simply, for the rest of the, uh, of the EU member states, to simply not buy um, Hungarian processed uh, products uh, from Mol refineries after two years if they are sourced from Russian oil. So that means they can uh, use it only inside uh, the country. <clears throat> Uh, the second uh, area is uh, nuclear. And uh, actually, um, 
In the nuclear sector, in Hungary, uh, things are actually uh, more to our advantage uh, than we, we would have thought. Uh, this is uh, because uh, right now Hungary is uh, less inclined to continue with the patch 2 uh, project and more inclined to speed up uh, the works to uh, extend the life of the existing four nu uh, nuclear units. For uh, those, um, um, actually, uh, they have both the uh, technical uh, staff uh, and uh, the capabilities which have been developed in the country. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the patch 2 is practically on hold for a long time uh, and will be on hold for a long time simply because in the permitting process, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty uh, concerning uh, whether uh, some technologies or equipment are going to be part of a sanctions list later on. Uh, so that, that gives us uh, a little bit of uh, leeway. Uh, on uh, nuclear supplies, yes, right now for, uh, for the existing units, uh, the uh, Russian uh, supplies are the best. But at the same time, it's not impossible to create a backup solution, even though it, uh, it costs some money. Uh, what is very important is that uh, there is uh, this sense that without Hungary voting uh, together on a package of sanctions, there is nothing that we can do to further decouple uh, Russia from, uh, uh, from the energy supplies in Europe. Uh, but actually, a lot of measures can be taken, either uh, being uh, included as a part of Repower EU, uh, in which uh, various countries are supported uh, through uh, EU funds, for example, to diversify uh, supply. <coughs> and this doesn't require any kind of unanimity. You can simply do that in all the other 26 countries. Uh, at the same time, there are a lot of measures which can be taken without uh, relying on unanimity. For example, uh, emergency market uh, regulations can be adopted with a 85% uh, uh, majority. So uh, that means that a lot of things can still be done without counting on Orban to, uh, to vote uh, further for the uh, decoupling on uh, Russian supplies. And uh, uh, Hungary becomes more and more isolated uh, in the sense that all the gas supplies around uh, the country, all the oil uh, and the possibility to export will be limited if we focus on uh, the source of the, uh, of, of the energy that is being uh, processed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll now pass over to Alena. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I have a presentation for you. Yeah, it's only... I think people can hear you. Uh, I don't, I don't. Do you hear me? Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, it's only for uh, illustration. There are no new numbers for you, I think. Uh, so today I want to speak about directions to increase pressure on the aggressor. Uh, and my goal is to get your support <laughs> in this matter. Uh, so we have an opportunity to make more powerful uh, coalition. Uh, let's start with, oh, sorry, um, uh, with guests. Alena, could you just um, move your head a little bit closer to the okay, microphone? Okay, thank you. Or the mic to you, yeah. Uh, I think that gas blackmail is failed. Uh, surprisingly, Gazprom's annual report is still available for us. Uh, so if you go to the Gazprom's website under Russian's IP, uh, you can see the real situation of the gas giant. Uh, a drop in annual profits is almost uh, 14%. Uh, it's hardly the plan that the Kremlin has drawn for itself. I think. Uh, gas prices in Europe remain at low level, as we see, uh, despite the active purchase of the resource by the EU countries, for example, through the uh, mechanism Aggregate EU, uh, which started last month. Yeah. Uh, the next Russian main resource is oil. Uh, slightly different situation here. Uh, the largest Russian companies operating in the oil trade do not provide direct access uh, to their financial performance. 
Uh, there are only general indicators in which any information about the volume of oil and oil product sales is completely raised. Uh, for example, Russian Luke Oil, there is a table with uh, data, uh, even showed a slight increase in profits for the year, which can be explained by a more demanded mix of gas, oil, and oil products in their portfolio. Uh, but this year, the forecast for this segment of Russian income are also disappointing. Uh, price ca caps have uh, come into force. There is no rush price growth. Uh, yes, there are gaps in the sanctions mechanism. Uh, and Russia creating a shadow fleet and uh, India is breaking records <laughs> in the export of petroleum products. But at the same time, Russian budget receives practically nothing from such schemes. Uh, therefore, our estimates uh, sanctions works. Uh, but the pressure on Russia must not stop. And there we have two directions. Uh, first, dig deeper. <laughs> it's something like uh, we see EU uh, is doing now. Uh, we know that the main thrust of the next round of sanctions will be to improve the tools already in place. The European Commission plans to restrict the activities of Russian organizations and companies from third countries, and that helps the Russian Federation bypass the embargo. Uh, is it planned there, that there will be a, about 19 different companies in the 11th package of sanctions? Uh, also, we welcome proposals of total ban on LNG and uh, price cap, oil price cap reduction. Uh, but there is another way uh, to increase pressure on Russia, the expansion of sanctions on other segments of Russian energy sector. Uh, first of all, it's LPG and nuclear segment. Uh, and if a LPG trade does not pose much of threat to energy security, uh, nuclear segment is a ticking time bomb. Uh, a year ago, Dixie Group uh, published the result of its uh, research about influence of Russian Rosatom. Uh, here is a very creative picture <laughs> from that research, from the document. Uh, the document was called Cutting the Tentacles of Russian Energy Octopus. And indeed it is. Rosatom has tentacles. Uh, having great influence in EAEA, access to information about the intentions of different countries to develop nuclear energy, uh, Mr. Chudakov, uh, had the directorate in the EAA that uh, collects this information. Uh, so they are the first who propose their uh, nuclear sector to uh, build these nuclear power plants in uh, third countries. Uh, Rosatom has the first place in the world in the portfolio of foreign nuclear power plants construction projects. As of today, Rosatom plans to build over 13 reactors abroad. Uh, it is important to understand uh, here that by proposing to impose sanctions against Rosatom, we do not want to threaten existing nuclear facility in Europe. Uh, the first thing that is important and must be done is to uh, deprive Russia of access to technologies and new contracts. Uh, since uh, the beginning of this year, there is more and more information that Rosatom will be the main supplier of electronics uh, for the uh, sta Russian state companies. Uh, Rosatom is already entering the stage of purchasing production facilities. Uh, and what does it mean? Uh, that due to the lack of sanctions, the company is confident that it will be able to provide the state with this uh, electronics and hence the army uh, with the necessary electronic base. Therefore, all organizations that are part of the structure of Rosatom and are not directly involved in servicing stations 
or producing fuel should be subject on, to sanctions. Uh, the diversification process should be divided into stages and uh, at best become part of the plan Repower EU. Uh, the second step is to reduce dependence on Rosatom. The process of diversifying fuel supplies should be launched now. But all uh, the difficult decisions are very difficult to make. That's why we need a coalition that will work to advocate sanctions against the Russian nuclear industry which we see can pose no less threat than the Russian army. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Elena. Uh, now I'll pass over to our final presentation, Dr. An. Yeah, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and after seven years, one uh, time um, to be in, back in Bulgaria. Uh, I will give you a short overview to the military situation uh, we are facing uh, today in the Black Sea region. Until uh, 2014, for many people in Europe, especially in Germany, the Black Sea was only a tourist destination. Now it is a scene of huge strategic disputes that are int intensifying here. The sea is the interface between southeastern Europe and Asia, as well as part of the new Belt Road Initiative of China. The region has taken new importance for um, Europe's energy security as a result of the capping um, of the energy partnership with Russia. Three of six bordering states of the Black Sea belong to NATO. Russia and Ukraine are at war, and Georgia had been in state of war, which Russia, as you know. As an inland sea, there is only access via the Dardanelles, which are controlled by Turkey. As an inland sea, air power, coastal batteries, and anti-aircraft systems, as well as drones, play a significant role in addition to the traditional maritime forces. However, for maritime domination per se, ships, boats, and submarines play the decisive role. What are the interests and the situation concerning military issues of the states which are involved? Let's have a look to Ukraine, Russia, Turkey, and at least Bulgaria. Ukraine can be cut off from its trade routes by Russia at any time. It is fatal for the country because Ukraine depends on its sea routes as an exporter of grain and fertilizers for agriculture. The country is not a naval power and has only small boats for coastal protection. At the beginning of war, Ukraine scuttled the frigate Krivak by itself. However, its long-range coastal rocket batteries and drones are of great importance as evidenced by the sinking of the Russian cruiser Moskva in April 22 and other Russian ships hit by cruise missiles. This also led to the recapture of Snake Island in July 22. The Russian fleet is now forced to operate outside the range of the coastal batteries as a distance of more than 500 uh, sorry, 250 kilometers. This is a significant success for Ukraine because it makes amphibious landings by Russian forces on the coast near Odessa or Cherson impossible. The sinking of the Moskva ended free Russian operations at sea. Russia is apparently unable to engage or destroy these coastal batteries, which does not reflect well on its military capabilities. However, Russia can still enforce a long-range blockade of ports and trade routes if Moscow so desires. At the moment, the so-called grain agreement from summer 22 prevents this from Russia, um, which Russia also benefits, as a renewed blockade would do considerable damage to Moscow's reputation, especially in Africa. For Russia, the Black Sea has strategic importance. It plays a central role in Russian world trade. Novorossiysk on the East Coast is Russia's most important port. With the Black Sea fleet, power projections are possible into the Eastern Mediterranean, but also into the Balkans, North Africa, and the Middle East. These are key regions in terms of energy resources and for security policy, as you know. The Black Sea Fleet has been stationed in Crimea since 793. The Soviet fleet was divided between Russia and Ukraine in 1999 in a ratio of 80 to 20. 
Sevastopol was leased by Russia as a naval port with a duration at least up to 2042. Russia cancelled the contract after the annexation of Crimea and confiscated most of the Ukrainian ships. More than 5,000 Ukrainian sailors transferred to Russian service. Sevastopol was home to 80% of Russian forces in the Black Sea region in 2022, underscoring the city's importance as a, port war, as a war port. The fleet consisted of more than 50 ships, including three frigates, eight corvettes, and six submarines, which are of modern standard. They can also fire precise missiles of cheap caliber. Numerous landing crafts highlighted the offensive character. Since 2014, the Russian military potential has tripled there. Crimea is also an important logistic base for supplying Russian troops in Ukraine, but also in Syria. However, due to strong Ukrainian coastal defenses, Russia now controls only the north central region and the northeast of the sea. Russia is unable to establish air superiority near the Ukrainian coast or to break down Ukrainian coastal defenses. Ukrainian attacks on Sevastopol even forced Russian submarines to move to Novorossiysk in September 22. Since then, Russia has limited itself to firing on land targets with caliber-type cruise missiles. But Russia appears to be slowly running out of this precise munition. For years, Moscow is seeking to expand its dominance in the Black Sea, especially against Western, but also to Turkish influence. The war against Georgia, the annexation of Crimea, the blockade of the Kerch Street, and thus domination of the Sea of Azov were part of this strategy. But now it seems to have reached its limits. In recent years, Turkey has developed into a regional power and is acting in accordance with its interests, which can also be at NATO's expense, as a purchase of Russian S-400 air defense systems and the veto against Sweden's accession to NATO show. On the other hand, there is no doubt that Turkey will fulfill its obligations as a NATO partner in the case of an attack on other partners. The country plays a key role because Ankara controls the Straits of Dardanelles and Bosporus and can thus regulate access to Black Sea. Turkey closed the Dardanelles and the Bosporus to all warships six days after the outbreak of war in accordance to the Montreux Agreement, which the treaty allows in wartime. One Russian cruiser and one destroyer waited nine months in vain, then both left the Mediterranean via the Suez Canal. NATO warships for non-bordering states are also not allowed to pass through, this, through the Straits. The status quo of forces at sea is thus maintained. Turkey wants to become the energy hub between the Caspian Sea and Europe, which would further enhance its position. It has the largest fleet of the three NATO countries in the Black Sea. Its fleet is potentially even larger than Russia's because Ankara could send warships from the Mediterranean to the Black Sea. Meanwhile, Turkey has built its own and successful defense industry. The drone by Raktar, you know, is the best known example of this. Turkish policy towards Russia and its Western allies is ambivalent. It does not support sanctions against Russia, Russian raw materials are imported, and exports to Russia have been massively expanded. This policy allows Turkey to act as a mediator, as shown by the, by the grain agreement from summer 22 I mentioned before. Thus, until January 23, 40 million tons of Ukrainian grain could be exported. On the other hand, Turkey supplies Ukraine with weapons and competes with Russia not only in the Black Sea, but also in the Caucasus region and in Syria. Since the outbreak of war at the latest, the Black Sea has been an important geopolitical focus for NATO. Only NATO, only NATO members, Turkey, Romania, and Bulgaria are allowed to permanently station naval forces in the Black Sea. So NATO cannot increase its presence here. Even in peacetime, the number of foreign ship warships and the length of their stay is severely limited by the Montreux Agreement. Presence of warships in the Black Sea for longer than three weeks are, is not permitted. NATO has frequently conducted maneuvers in the Black Sea region, most recently Defender Europe in April 21, or Seabreeze, an exercise 
led by Bulgaria and currently in May and June, the exercise Sever Garden in Romania with uh, about 10,000 soldiers. These exercises mainly involved the development, uh, the deployment of uh, large scale equipment. However, NATO increased its presence on land after the annexation of Crimea in 2014. In total, there are now eight so called battle groups from the Baltics to Bulgaria. Each of can include up to 1,500 soldiers and may be brought up to a brigade. The battle group in Bulgaria is combat ready since December 22. In addition, surveillance of the airspace from the Baltics to the Black Sea has been intensified. Last year, NATO aircraft flew 220 missions in uh, the Black Sea region. This is twice more than the year before. All of this increases the risk of incidents, of course, of which the crash of an US drone caused by an attack by a Russian fighter aircraft or the near shooting down of a Frontex reconnaissance plane are only the best known. Let's have at least a look, uh, look to Bulgaria. Bulgaria has a strategically important role due to its location and as a reliable NATO partner. Therefore, it is important that the military equipment from Soviet times is, is replaced by modern equipment which, comply, which complies with NATO standards. The best known example is certainly the MiG-29 jets, which could be replaced by F-16s. In this way, the dependence on Russia maintenance and spare parts could be eliminated. As you know, Bulgaria supplied after beginning of war weapons and ammunition to Poland, Romania and the US, which then sent them to Ukraine. By October 22, the equivalent value was about 1 billion euros. For artillery shells of the 152 millimeter type for Soviet designed howitzers, Bulgaria is the main and largest producer. Likewise, supplies of fuel from Bulgaria are of great importance for Ukraine. Here, the equivalent value in 22 was 700 million, million euros. This fuel, as you know, was made from Russian crude oil by Lukoil Bulgaria, which is an irony of the present time. And this concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. So I want to move on to a little bit of a um, debate and discussion now between our panelists after we've heard their um, introductory presentations. Um, so we've talked a lot about sanctions and sanctions um, avoidance, um, and we now have 10 um, sanctions packages on the table in the EU and many more if we count the UK, US, Australia and others. And we're 1.5 years almost into the war. But Moscow's economy contracted just 2% last year, while its war continues to plow on and it finds increasingly creative ways to circumvent Western sanctions. So I, I want to start with you, um, Melanie. Have Western sanctions been a success in your view, given these facts? I'm sorry, say it again. Have Western sanctions been effective in your view, given some of these facts? Um, I think that the package of sanctions against Russia will never be sufficient for what they have done uh, to the world. The, the, uh, I mean, our discussion last night, violating every rule of engagement that, that the civilized world has on, on uh, uh, aggression, war, and conduct of the war. And so I think what we need to do with sanctions is be very, very careful that our sanctions aren't having the opposite effect of what we would like them to have. And, and the one thing that I would say, and this is obviously a US perspective, that's where I'm from, is that uh, gas sanctions, and, and because of the structure of gas markets, they're not as effective um, because it's, it's, it's regional gas markets. But the, the Russia is now desperately looking for other markets for its natural gas. And the obvious, obvious uh, target is going to be Asia. For, um, for, uh, for looking for markets for their gas. We need to be very, very thoughtful and careful that we don't 
encourage Asian countries to work more closely with Russia because they need the natural gas and Russia needs the markets. And so that's where I think the U.S. comes in. We need to continue our, um, our uh, LNG exports and increasing them and, uh, and uh, uh, provide that supply. Um, uh, so I just, I think we need to be thoughtful, careful, and ensure in our collective action mm. that we don't have unintended consequences from sanctions. So. No, that, that's really interesting. And, and I'd like to uh, bring in Olena now as well to, to just see kind of your views in, in response to that. I mean, do you feel that sanctions kind of have been largely successful in achieving their aim? And, you know, this, this word that um, Melanie uses, careful, should be, we, we be taking a careful approach when it comes to sanctions? What do you think? Uh, I totally agree with uh, Melanie. I think that uh, sanctions work. Uh, but uh, Russian has... Uh, support uh, f uh, powerful I think it uh, very for Russia's uh, economic uh, support of India uh, China and we have to be careful with this direction so at this stage sanctions are very efficient mm. for me and uh, this uh, 2023 will show us uh, the result mm -hmm, mm -hmm. great and in, uh, in oil and in, uh, and in gas sector too. Absolutely, yeah. and I, we, we've talked about um, Asia here briefly, um, and that's kind of something topical at the moment um, in Brussels. Obviously, the EU is struggling to wrap up um, its 11th sanctions package. One of the key hurdles there is the role of third countries and how we kind of deal with them. So, you know, when we look at Central Asia, for example, dual-use goods exports from the EU to Central Asia shot up by 80% last year. So, I mean, Martin, I want to bring you in here. How do you make sure to close some of these sanctions loopholes while also damaging, not damaging kind of some of these relationships the EU has with, you know, some of these countries? I think, um, as we have um, noted in our Kremlin Playbook series of reports over the last decade now, um, it's about us, it's about closing our governance loopholes. So uh, the EU needs to streamline its anti-money laundering legislation, um, accelerate the operation of the new institution it created, DAMWA, the Anti-Money Laundering Authority, and give it stronger uh, 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 responsibilities on monitoring sanctions evasion. Mm -hmm. um, some of the uh, some of these transactions are happening through intermediaries located within the EU, uh, which have uh, sometimes Russian ultimate beneficial ownership, mm -hmm. but we don't have um, a, a good standards for tracking ultimate beneficial ownership. So mm -hmm. this is this this will be key. Uh, element uh, and uh, of course uh, better coordination between different uh, financial intelligence units uh, within Europe. I mean, AMUA needs to do that, but also transatlantic co cooperation because in many cases we have seen that even when there are uh, credible signals from from the U.S. about sanctions invasion, the reaction of European authorities uh, uh, have been too slow, which allows a lot of lead time for these intermediaries to change ownership, to obfuscate it, and, and then continue doing business with Russia. Mm -hmm. No, that's really interesting, but I, I, I guess just um, going back to that sort of original question, I mean, how, how should the EU kind of deal with, you know, countries like India or countries oh. like sort of Kazakhstan, where, you know, on the one hand, it's trying to balance mm -hmm. good relationship, but on the other hand, it's trying to, you know, close some of these gaps in the sanctions regimes. How do you, how do you manage that balancing act? Well, it's, 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 it's quite complicated, obviously, and I, th I think the EU needs to take a more transactional approach in its relationships with its, with its players so that, um, so French shoring uh, uh, basically requires not only preaching democratic values, integrity, etc., mm -hmm. but it means also providing uh, a real value to this, to this country, incentivizing that they replace their economic relationship with Russia. Uh, in a viable format, uh, uh, and also, of course, uh, the current, for example, oil sanctions uh, allow Russia to 
uh, uh, move crude to, to these countries without really noticing any effect in its production. The reason is that um, uh, uh, there are no secondary sanctions that, uh, and this means that many intermediaries around the world, shippers, mm -hmm. traders, insurers that are non-EU or non-G7 can keep on doing business in the US and Europe. Um, the penalties for breaking the, the sanctions are hilarious. Um, I was, uh, Constanza, who is uh, one of the principal uh, um, authors of our analysis, uh, was investigating this issue and she found out that uh, basically it's just 90 days of a ban yeah. for a shipper uh, evading sanctions. So if you hire a tanker that uh, ships uh, you know, one million barrels of uh, Russian crude oil, yeah. Uh, I mean, it cannot operate for just 90 days and then it keeps on going. Mm. So. No, that, that's really interesting. And on that same theme, Marco, I, I'd quite like to bring you in here. I mean, the war has largely seen EU countries unite together, but there are clear signs on sort of collective security that in some cases it may also challenge that collective security with, you know, Hungary indicating, for example, it doesn't want to enter any war with Russia ever while NATO and sanction skeptic forces are kind of gaining ground in other countries like Slovakia, for example. I mean, does this development worry you? And is there a risk that NATO is also being strained by the war? I think that the position of Hungary, for example, um, concerning um, the energy security or sanctions is uh, completely different to the opinion concerning NATO. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, at the moment, I cannot see any evidence that um, that uh, the, the treaty is um, not stable. Um, I would say uh, the war um, uh, enforced NATO to see that um, that they, that NATO did not do enough from for its eastern flank. And now we have a completely other situation in air policing, the battle groups, and all the NATO states um, are cooperating very well. So uh, I'm not afraid um, that there could be uh, any problems uh, in the next, next time. Interesting. And, um, and Otilia, I mean, as, as you touched on in your kind of presentation, uh, reliance on Russia, especially for energy, has switched from the overt to the covert. Um, and, you know, while EU countries won't be rushing to assign contracts with Gazprom perhaps anytime soon, um, indirect dependencies do remain. I mean, at, at one point last summer, Romania was almost 30 percent dependent on Russian gas imports, despite none of its state-owned companies having long-term contracts with Gazprom. So, I mean, how do we avoid these indirect dependencies in the future, and what are some of the risks you see there? Yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to, uh, to come back a little bit uh, to your first question, mm -hmm. and then I'll uh, answer on this. Uh, related to the effectiveness of the sanctions, uh, first of all, by what measure? Mm -hmm. uh, did they stop Putin? No. Uh, did they cause uh, Russians to revolt and uh, um, uh, massive uprising? No. Uh, but at the same time, did they cause uh, OMV, Uniper, uh, and uh, the others to, uh, uh, to stop pushing for Nord Stream 2? I think so. Mm. Uh, so this is why I'm saying that creating an environment in which it is simply uh, immorally, uh, morally reprehensible to continue doing business as usual, mm. probably this has a much bigger impact on our collective support for Ukraine mm -hmm. than the other way around. And I think this should not, uh, not be neglected. Uh, related to, uh, well, uh, Romania doesn't have a really good uh, and consistent policy in general, and uh, this is a major uh, political failure um, in our country. Uh, I think uh, right now what is important is that we have alternatives, mm -hmm. and also that the gas demand has declined substantially, uh, and uh, there will be uh, some uh, new production, and uh, also the, the diversification in the region will allow us not to be in any way blackmailed, and mm -hmm. that was the, the main threat. Um, I wanted also to, to mention briefly uh, about what remains the major vulnerability in the region uh, to, uh, to Russia's energy supplies. I think the most vulnerable country right now is uh, Moldova. 
uh, all the rest of us are quite okay. Ukraine I don't mention because that's a, uh, it's a country under war. Uh, but right now, uh, Russia seeks to use energy to destabilize politically Moldova. Uh, and uh, possibly even uh, cause a, a humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. So uh, last year, uh, they uh, um, consecutively cut supplies of gas, uh, and um, they have managed to, uh, well, Moldova, man uh, you know, uh, there is the right bank and the left bank, left bank being Transnistria. Uh, the right bank, which is controlled by Chisinau, managed to source energy for its own consumption from Romania and from, uh, from other countries. But it's still very dependent on the electricity supply from Transnistria, which is controlled by a Russian company. Uh, right now, uh, there is a risk that uh, maybe sometime uh, during the uh, autumn, Russia will be willing even to cut gas supplies uh, to Transnistria uh, and uh, in order to cause a humanitarian crisis and uh, to, to make the people from living in uh, Transnistria to move uh, to the uh, right bank. If they do that, uh, actually Transnistria is only sustainable by the uh, gas supplies from Gazprom. Mm -hmm. And that would mean a complete collapse of the Transnistrian uh, so-called authorities, separatist authorities. But Moldova is not yet prepared to deal with, uh, with this situation. Uh, so, uh, these are the major threats that uh, Russia can still cause in the, in the region. The rest of us are quite okay, even if the uh, prices uh, can, uh, are going to be still quite volatile in the following months. I think we will be able to, to survive the next winter even with less dangers than last winter, and mm -hmm. we are getting more and more resilient uh, to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So to be clear, some of these indirect dependencies that remain from Russia to the EU indirectly, for now, you think there's no risk there? Yes, so it's, uh, they are declining. Mm -hmm. And the more we are diversifying, uh, we should have uh, done that before. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, and now we are paying uh, for uh, for not having done that before. But we managed to survive uh, in a way in which uh, we have been told for a long time that it would not be possible. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. great, great. And now I'm just going to uh, do something a little bit rogue, and I, I want to ask a quick question and see what our panelists think. Um, so I, I'm going to ask you to put your um, hands up if you agree with the following question. So we talked a lot about gas. Um, in the wake of Russia's um, war in Ukraine, which has exposed so starkly um, the energy security issues related to gas imports, is this narrative that gas is a transitional fuel or gas is a bridge fuel, is that narrative now dead, especially in Europe, if you agree with that statement? Uh, I was going to say just the panelists, for starters. So no one agrees with that statement. Everyone thinks that gas can still continue to be a transitional fuel. Okay, interesting. We'll dig... Well, I, well to, for, to, to play the devil's advocate... Okay, I think go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I, I think that the logic for using natural gas um, in the long run is, is dying out. And there is a European consensus that we need to phase out natural gas to achieve long-term energy and climate security. Uh, because true energy independence means that you don't import from anyone, not just... Because right now there is this, this risk uh, that in the panic of the European energy crisis in 2022, we're going to replace one dependence on an authoritarian country like Russia with another dependence on an authoritarian country. Maybe this time it's Algeria or Qatar or Azerbaijan. And, uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, the strengthening of the transatlantic uh, relationship uh, is partially based on U.S. LNG supply, and, this, uh, and US, the U.S. has really saved uh, 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 Europe in this crisis. Uh, but I don't think one way to kind of bridge this gap between uh, a, 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 f a carbon neutral future and short-term energy security risk is not to, to lock ourselves in uh, basically long-term contracts. So if we have new LNG contracts, they should be limited to, let's say, five, seven years, uh, because otherwise uh, we might get into a, a much costlier uh, exit later on. Thanks. 
Great, great. And uh, I think Melanie perhaps has a different p perspective, so I want to uh, bring a, you in a, here. A, a little different perspective. The, um, the, uh, I'd say uh, a couple things, and, and I do think that natural gas is a critical bridge fuel. We tend to, in all of our energy conversations, focus on electricity. We have alternatives to natural gas for power generation. Um, uh, we have very in, in, insufficient alternatives for natural gas in the industrial sector. And, and I think that we need to be very, very careful about our industrial sector because you need the natural gas for the heat that you need for key industrial processes. So we don't have technology alternatives right now. We could, it could be hydrogen in the future, um, uh, uh, and, and, but, but our supplies of hydrogen are insufficient. Our, right now we're making hydrogen with natural gas and, and we're not nearly ready for uh, uh, significant supplies of green hydrogen uh, uh, for the industrial and other sectors, quite frankly, that we're gonna need um, uh, 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 natural gas for right now. And I'd say one other thing, we haven't really talked about, uh, actually two other things. Um, uh, Martin's uh, definition of energy independence is importing nothing. For renewables, we're importing a lot of metals and minerals for renewable uh, renewable uh, generation, and uh, now the 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 lifespan of the technologies is what dictates how much how much metals and minerals we need. So it's a very different measure, but we are still uh, moving a lot of metals and minerals around the world. And then I'd say one final thing is that. Right now, and I think we're, we haven't touched on it very much, natural gas is critical for food security. It's the ammonia and the fertilizer uh, for food security around the world. We need to be very thoughtful and careful about that as well. So. Yeah, some, some very interesting points. I'll, I'll just let Martin respond to that um, briefly. Um, but I also was wondering whether you could tell me that, you know, even though the U.S. is clearly an ally of Europe, does swapping one major supplier, Russia, to another, the U.S., in some ways threaten the notion of European strategic autonomy? Well, um, I wouldn't say so because... Um, it's the transatlantic unity on geopolitical matters right now that keeps, I think, the world from exploding, to be really honest. Um, you know, breaking this unity on such a critical matter as uh, maintaining short-term energy security uh, is a necessary fight uh, right now. Um, but that doesn't mean that European governments would give up on their long-term commitments on decarbonization, uh, and I, f I totally agree with all the arguments that Melanie mentioned on the role that natural gas will play, but technology is advancing quite rapidly, and true, uh, natural gas will not disappear in the next 10 years, or even 15 years for sure, but uh, uh, we should incentivize new technologies for low carbon solutions, and I think really the, the biggest obstacle to energy independence will be in the future, uh, energy and climate security risk would be dependence on critical raw materials from authoritarian countries, from politically unstable places, because this will be the, the, uh, the make or break of probably uh, geopolitical rivals, rivalries in the future. Great, great. And, and just my final question is goes to um, Alena. Um, there is a key variable in this discussion which we haven't really touched upon. So Ukraine and Gazprom have a gas transit deal um, supplying gas to Europe that against all odds has um, continued um, amid the war. So this expires next year, and if it's cut, it could see Russian imports to the EU drop by around 50%. Do you have any sense about whether this transit deal might be extended? And what are some of the risks, kind of, if it isn't? question uh, there, are there are a lot of discussions in Ukraine about this gas transit uh, so uh, one point of view is that uh, we have some money from it but it is uh, in 
uh, in the world time, it's, I think it's not the only. Uh, and I, uh, I think that uh, this transit will be stopped next year. Uh, but um, I think that for EU, uh, for Ukraine, there is no risk. Uh, Ukraine, for example, has uh, its own production. Uh, our uh, Minister of Energy uh, worked uh, hard on uh, our energy strategy, and uh, uh, next year there will be no need to import uh, LNG uh, to Ukraine. Uh, I think that EU uh, have the same plans and uh, LNG uh, maybe uh, from Russian will uh, cover your uh, consumption. Perfect. Well, thank you so much to, to all our panelists. I think we have time for just a couple of, of, of audience questions. Um, yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, to the organizers and the panelists. It was a very uh, interesting discussion. I'm Stefan Karelev, and I would like, like to ask Dr. Arndt a question uh, concerning the, what he mentioned about uh, sending the uh, MiG fighter jets uh, to F-16. Uh, are we sadly not too late for this, since I have already read that, there that Ukraine is in the talks of being sent actually F-16s already, so uh, isn't this, uh, you know, the old Soviet fighter jets, are they not already... Uh, you know, there is no need for them already in the war, or do you think there is still a critical window to be able to send them and for them to be useful in the fight uh, for Ukraine? Thank you. Um, the discussion to change the old Soviet material um, for new material uh, from, from NATO states is, I don't know, 15 years old. And therefore, yes, we are too late. Um, but uh, I think Romania um, made the decision that they will get F-16s end of uh, next year and Bulgaria end of 25. Um, up to that time, uh, air policing will be done by um, other NATO states, uh, for example, Italy, uh, uh, Spain and Netherlands at, at the moment. And therefore, I, I don't think that there will be a gap um, concerning uh, air policing in the Black Sea region. So on that, in, in this, uh, on that hand, it is not too late. Um, it's better to make it too late than you uh, will not do, do it uh, at any time. So the, the changing is necessary, and um, I think the war pushed, pushed the decisions to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, I have some comments which are in essence questions. Um, first of all, I, I totally subscribe to the idea that sanctions work. Uh, and regardless of the high prices, sanctions work. The problem is sanction circumvention. Now, I don't know why this omits the debate, 70% of the crude oil that Russia exports is done through um, tankers owned by uh, oligarchs in our neighboring countries. It's EU country. Now, when you ask them, they say, okay, if we don't do it, somebody else will do it. Now, if you can't deal with that, and it's 70% of the greatest export that Russia has, therefore the greatest source for funding this war, and if you can't cope with this, there is a problem. It's, it's not that sanctions don't work. Sanctions circumvention is very effective. The second, the Black Sea would become more and more important. Why? Because Russian gas flows switch from north to south. Basically, the northern route is not valid. I, the political risk and the war risk of transit through Ukraine is unmitigable. Mitigable. Anything can happen overnight. Uh, so therefore, that is why they focus and focus on this, what we call it, solidarity ring, which is the EU, 
uh, idea of having a good diversification. And what Russians have is the Turkish gas hub, when you whitewash Russian gas. Now, if you don't pay attention to this, then formally Russian gas is not bad in the EU. Therefore, people can buy it in Turkey and ship it as their own mix. And that's a major problem again because we're talking about quantities that would be equivalent or more to the quantities that are now transited through Ukraine. And that's a major problem. Um, in terms of, of independence, energy independence, I totally subscribe to Melanie. Uh, energy independence is uh, I don't know why energy independence in the United States is defined as energy dependent because they have indigenous production of oil and gas. And that's a major definition of energy independence. Why Europe doesn't have this is its own problem. At the moment, Europe produces less than 10% of what it consumes in terms of gas. Now, what sort of energy independence is that? What is, by definition, makes Europe absolutely vulnerable to all the hiccups in the world global market? Now, it's a self-inflicted wound, I'm sorry to say, and the news of today is that three of the largest uh, wells, gas wells, in the, in the, the Norway producers have been shut down. Now, that means that summer prices would go up and the futures are up to 45, 46, which wouldn't otherwise happen and which wouldn't otherwise go into whatever Russia sells. Finally, um, Russia is still importing Russian gas into Bulgaria, although the contract has, has, uh, has been canceled, terminated. Who is doing that? Everybody knows and nobody addresses the issue. Uh, so I believe the sanctions, sanctions work. I mean, you can't define any other way but a success, a success that before uh, the war, uh, the uh, revenues that uh, Russia generated just solely of, out of gas was in the range of 100 billion euros, less, 90, 85, 90. Now it's less than 30. So they work. The problem is circumvention, and Russians excel at that. Thanks so much. Yeah, Melanie, you'd like to respond? I, I wish my answer had been what you just said. Okay, when I was asked, I, I totally agree with you. Circumvention is a, 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 a significant issue. It's, it's part of what I was describing as unintended consequences of, of sanctions and, and um, and, uh, but I would say on the U.S. having uh, abundant energy supplies, the, um, I started a shale gas R&D company in 2002. No one was thinking about shale gas then. In 2003, Lee Raymond, CEO of Exxon, testified on Capitol Hill that North America was running out of natural gas. 2003, the, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve testified and said the same thing. North America is running out of natural gas. The, the, um, the, uh, some technologies that we didn't anticipate uh, or, or think about horizontal drilling developed by the Department of Energy, one of its laboratories, and polycrystalline drill bits enabled shale gas production, but it also enabled shale oil production. And, and so there were technology breakthroughs that enabled the development and, and the complete turnaround in U.S. fortunes. By two, that, that was 2003, they said we were running out of gas. In 2010 is when shale gas took off. So, so and another thing that, that I think we need to be thinking about in the clean energy transition and I, don't, I can't remember if it was Martin if you said something about this, the, uh, the changes in technologies. Changes in technologies are huge. I have a slide on this too. 
the, the time from in, uh, invention and investment in, in research to the time when you actually have commercial deployment of most of the technologies we are talking about today, 30, 40 years. And in my view, we don't have 30 or 40 years for climate change. We got to start using now the technologies that we have now in or as, as we are developing these new technologies and deploying them. And, and uh, so, uh, and figure out how to accelerate deployment too. And, uh, but, but uh, DOE, when it was started in 1978, one of its first huge investments in energy technology was solar in 1978. So it didn't happen overnight. And, and, um, and so that's why I keep saying we need a thoughtful sequenced transition uh, to a, a, a net zero future, working with what we have now, investing heavily in what we know we're going to need uh, and, and I include infrastructure in that. So just a few thoughts. Great, thanks Melanie. And the ambassador had a, had a question, perhaps our last question. No, actually I don't have a question. I have a lot of comments. Um, I wish to thank you all of you for these interventions, but I am quite disappointed for several uh, issues. And I thank Ambassador Vasilev to bring some concrete issues on the table because uh, the topic was countering the Kremlin playbook in the Black Sea region. And apart from uh, Dr. Arndt, there has been no Black Sea focus. Uh, moreover, uh, you have been talking about EU energy policy, EU energy decisions, and I don't see a member of the European Union Commission energy director or sanctions directory at the table. So it is a completely unbalanced discussion. Um, not only that, and I wish to thank Mrs. Uh, Kenderlin on bringing the topic on the table of industry support and competitiveness. Because if you talk of energy sanctions and aligning EU to the US, as someone told at the beginning quite improperly, is that you have to talk of also the Inflation Reduction Act that the United States introduced, and it's quite disruptive for the market especially considering the problem of energy supply. And so that's a big issue, and we should have had here at the table an expert on sanctions and an expert on state aid. So we should align both US and, and EU, but not having a new commission expert on energy, sanctions, and state aid, we cannot even have a properly informed discussion. Third, it happens that I'm an expert on sanctions, because I've been working on a bilateral on the Italian team on sanctions bilaterally and on the EU, UN uh, Security Council team on sanctions. And when I listen to someone that says that there is no coordination between US and EU on sanctions, it's just nonsense. Because we are completely coordinated, we coordinate. We have different decisions, but we are coordinating our decisions. And I've been working with OFAC, with GAFI, with all the intelligence, financial intelligence unit. The real problem is the loophole in sanctions. Thank you again, Ambassador Vasilev. We know exactly where the loopholes are and how to counter. It is a political decision and it's not easy to take because it involves bilateral EU and US relations with such countries. We don't have to forget also, we, don't, we have a, a sort of a, a problem now that is quite huge, is how not to lose the developing countries the so-called outreach, the global outreach. And thank you again, Mrs. Kenderlin, to, to uh, raise this, because it's not only Asia, it's Africa. And it is important for the support for countering Russian war in Ukraine, to stop the war, to get the favor, to gain the souls, the people, the governments from Africa to our cause. That's the most important thing. And last but not least, again, I'm disappointed, we are talking about sanctions, and there is no expert on sanctions here, but the aim of sanctions, we are talking of the aim of sanctions. Which is the aim of sanctions against Russia? It's not punishment of Russia. It's not destroying the Russian economy. It's just to stop the war and to bring Russia to the negotiating table. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Martin, did you want to perhaps respond to some of those comments? Well, um, when we talk about 
um, sanctions and when we talk about European energy security, um, I think, yes, it, of course, the loopholes in the sanctions allow for the ESA Convention. We haven't been too specific because otherwise this conference would have to take one week, to be honest. So also thank you to Ambassador Vasily for, for, for the great comments. But it has also been the case that many of these loopholes within the sanctions regime have been negotiated, have been agreed upon by individual member states looking to preserve some of their economic and political ties with Russia, even amid the Russian invasion. Um, and also coordination um, might not be as successful as possible because otherwise we wouldn't have what some, uh, some of the comments of Ambassador Vasilev alluded to in terms of uh, natural gas flowing through the back door. Um, we wouldn't have uh, a significant increase of European companies exporting sensitive technology via third countries to Russia. So, I mean, there is always a case for improving. That's, that's what we, we, we aim to achieve. And this means better institutional accountability and a better capacity. Because in many cases, it's about lack of enough capacity, enough people to actually follow up all of these complicated schemes. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, in terms of participation of European officials, usually European officials shy away from sensitive topics like the ones that we discussed today. We always try to get European officials and they think this is too political for them. Thank you. So thank you so much, everyone, for a dynamic discussion, for your introductions, and everyone for their comments. I'd like to thank uh, Martin, Melanie, um, Otilia, Olena, and Marco for their, um, all of their contributions. Um, and I wish you all a pleasant day. Thank you very much.